actually used to live up north, so I won't, I won't do that because I know it's nothing compared to North Dakota, so, or south. Um, but it is cold for here. So anyway, hope everybody is doing all right. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of being taught by Donna Whitman. Um, Donna, how long have you been here? Well, 15, 15? Wow. Okay, yes, okay. Donna's, Donna's put up with us for a long time. That's, yes, that's the bottom line. Anyway, she and uh, Andy are very faithful servants. Um, we have the joy of being in the group, which we dearly love. Uh, Donna, for those of you who don't know, is also head of our ladies' ministry. She is our ladies' ministry director, and she's a really good cook, <laughs> and she loves to serve people. So anyway, she's going to be teaching us tonight from the end of uh, chapter 2 of Philippians, so I'm really looking forward to it. Let's open with prayer, and then Donna, you can come up, all right? Father, we come tonight just uh, thanking you and praising you just for all your blessings. Lord, there's so many blessings that we enjoy every day that we do not deserve and we could never deserve, and you're so merciful to your children, and we just thank you for that. Thank you for the privilege of coming here today and just being able to study the word together. I pray that you would bless all the ladies that are so faithful um, to this study, and I pray that you would just open our understanding as we go through the book of Philippians. I pray that you would help Donna as she teaches us tonight, just give her insight and uh, help her just to say exactly what you would have her to say. Lord, I do pray for the many prayer needs in our body. I pray that we would be faithful just to serve one another, to love one another as Christian sisters, and that you would strengthen the relationships that we have here in this church. Father, we love you, and we just give you this evening. In your precious name we pray. Amen. headset all day so that's why my hair's flat so <laughs> it'd be nice to talk without a headset all right this is my first time doing this and I have to say that it has been an eye-opener to study and prepare to teach a lesson I have so much more appreciation for those who teach and for the amount of time that the pastors put into their lessons it's just incredible how much you can learn and how much God can can teach you and open up your heart and just say you can do this and so when Danny asked me would I um, teach I'm like I I'm not qualified to teach and he said do you love the Lord and I said yeah and he said then you can teach so <laughs> I think that he and Danny were uh, he and Carrie were probably in cahoots on that because the next Sunday's when Carrie preached about teaching and helping out when you're asked. So anyway, needless to say, the Lord directed me to step out on a limb and say yes that I would do it. So like I said, through my study, and I've written everything down because this is my first time, so I don't want to miss anything. Through my study and preparing for this lesson, I have come to a deeper appreciation for those who teach and the hours they spend preparing and how they faithfully pray for the plot flock. When receiving those postcards, I know you guys, some of you guys have probably received them that the elders send out and say they prayed for you. I think I appreciate that a whole lot more now, knowing the time that they put into it. So um, when you receive those, know that they have put a lot of faithful hours into to praying for you guys. So uh, following Kevin's sermon this past Sunday on the essentials of our prayer, li prayer life, I realized how many countless hours in prayer and service to the Lord they must spend. 
this is a wonderful example of selfless service, much as Paul describes, spending hours gathered in prayer, preparation for teaching and counseling, all while they're away from their own family. So to start our lesson tonight, uh, we are at the end of Philippians 2. Um, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians, and I challenge you tonight, who is your Paul? I think I have learned more about Paul through this study than, than I've ever really realized what Paul did. Um, who do you look to as your mentor in your life? Timothy had a wonderful example of a mentor, and I challenge you to find that mentor. We're so blessed with the luxury of the, the elderly people that we have, the most mature people here in the church, and I challenge you to find somebody to mentor you as Paul and Timothy had that great relationship. So to start with, um, we'll look at the three models of spiritual service. Paul was a bold, fearless leader. Timothy, a quiet, devoted assistant. Epaphroditus, diligent, behind-the-scenes worker. And as we go through these, just think about which one you want to be here at Twin City and in your life out in the community as well. So we'll look at Paul first. All through our study of Philippians, we see Paul teaching humility and unity. He loved the church of Philippi and was continually teaching them and praying for them. He was in a continual state of selfless service for Christ. The definition of selfless service for Christ is always an exchange of lesser for greater. Paul considered his life nothing in comparison with Christ, and he wrote in Philippians 3.8, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them rubbish so that I may gain Christ. Paul's love for Christ was reflected in the joy that was produced by his service. He loved the Philippians, and he counted it a joy and a privilege to teach them, even if it meant great suffering and, or even losing his life. So through his sufferings, Paul exhibited the mindset of Christ. And the mindset of Christ is defined as to be like Christ, and set, who set aside his own comfort to take on the form of a servant and the benefit of, for the benefit of his people. And from this, we're able to share the gospel of his death, burial and resurrection, how he suffered on, in his days on earth, on the cruel cross and paying the penalty for our sins, the ultimate selfless sacrifice. Paul, was, Paul also suffered during his service for Christ. He was imprisoned and finally paid the ultimate price of his life while serving Christ. Paul was imprisoned while writing this letter by being chained to a Roman guard where he lived in rented quarters. Though he was free to write letters and have visitors, this allowed him to continue to evangelize and preach the gospel to those whom he came in contact with. There were a lot of people in Rome who truly did not, <clears throat> did not like Paul, and, and Timothy, Epaphroditus, felt that they needed to protect Paul while he was in Rome. So Paul couldn't go to the Philippians due to his imprisonment, so he undoubtedly earnestly prayed for God's guidance and will for his ministry to go on with the Philippians, as he desired for them to love the Lord as much as he did, learning from his example, thus pinning the thesis statement of the book, as we've already learned in a previous, state, in a previous lesson. I think that was with Danny when he called Philippians 127, our thesis statement. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul had groomed Timothy to do just that, to carry on his work when he was no longer able to because of his death or either imprisonment. He didn't know what sentence was going to be handed down to him, if he was going to be set free or if he was going to remain there. So in the scriptures that we're looking at tonight, we'll just read, um, read those scriptures. Sorry, I should have had that pulled up here. Philippians 2, 19 through 30. 
But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for all and was distressed for you all, and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ he came close to death not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. So now we'll go through the scriptures and kind of break it down and talk about what each section means. So Paul started with, I hope in the Lord Jesus. Paul was saying if it's the Lord's will, he wanted to send Timothy back to the Philippians. Timothy knew them well as he was with Paul and had been involved in the planting of the church at Philippi, as we read in Acts 16. Timothy is Paul's kindred spirit and had the same mindset of Christ that was exhibited in Paul. And again, the definition of the mindset of Christ is imitating Christ's own service when he set aside his own comfort to take on the form of a servant for the benefit of his people. So too, Timothy set aside his own interests to serve with Paul for the benefit of the Philippians in service for Christ. So here I pause to ask, who's your Timothy? Who's mentoring and encouraging you in your spiritual growth? Who's working with you? Who are you working with? And who are you challenging in their spiritual welfare? So Timothy, a native of Lystra in the province of Galatia, which is now modern Turkey, his mother was Eunice. She was Jewish, and his father was a Greek, and most of the scriptures that I read said his father was probably dead because everything referred to him as was. There was nothing in the present tense that indicated that he was actually alive when Paul met Timothy. So because of his Greek and Jewish heritage, he was qualified and a good candidate to minister with Paul to the Gentile world. Paul led Timothy to Christ as a missionary to Lystra on his first journey there. When he later returned to Lystra, Paul chose Timothy to accompany him in his ministry as he had a good reputation for godliness. Timothy would then travel with Paul during his ministry to Berea, Athens, Corinth, and Jerusalem. He was with Paul in his first Roman imprisonment and went to Philippi after Paul's release. Paul often sent Timothy as his representative to the different churches. So Paul couldn't send Timothy immediately. He said in in the scripture, I hope to send Timothy shortly, but he couldn't send him immediately. Paul's purpose in sending Timothy was so he could see how well they were doing and report to Paul the condition of the Philippi church. Paul's delay in sending Timothy could have been because he was assisting Paul with some matter in Rome, possibly the false teachers and the the people who were after Paul while he was in Rome. So Timothy assisted Paul and tried to protect him from the people who actually wanted to hurt him. And Paul, Paul goes on to write, so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul fully expected Timothy to have enough time to reach the Philippians and return with a positive report before his sentence was handed down. And he still didn't know. He had hoped, and he says that over again, that 
that he would be set free and be able to return to the Philippians. And we know he later was before he died, but he didn't know that for sure. So verse 20, for I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Paul highlighted seven qualifications of Timothy in this passage that the Philippians should emulate. He was a kindred spirit. He had genuine concern. He was, he was single-minded. I realize I didn't put these in a list so I could tell you, so I got to flip my page. He had proven his worth. He was submissive, and he was willing to be sacrificial. So in thinking about these things, um, let's define kindred spirit. And kindred spirits are persons who are like-minded. And there might be somebody who thinks like I do. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but <laughs> they were definitely kindred spirits. Paul had worked with Timothy. He had learned from him, and he knew he could imitate Christ as Paul imitated Christ in his life, and that's what Tim, uh, Paul worked for was to train him to be an imitator of Christ. So Paul and Timothy were like-minded through their travels and their ministry together. Paul wanted the Philippians to imitate Timothy as he was an imitator of Christ. And there was no one else of Timothy's stature. He was instructed in the scripture from childhood by his mother and grandmother as we read in 2 Timothy 1.5. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded is in you also. And he was highly regarded by those who knew him. And as we read in Acts 16, too, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were, who were at Lystra and Iconium. So that made him a perfect candidate because he was high, highly regarded and the Philippian church knew him very well. The second qualification of genuine concern is a strong feeling or for something or someone, often to the point of being burdened. And I liken that to our genuine concern for our children. Those of you who have children, I mean, I think I'd go to the ends of the earth for my children, even as an adult, and, and I think they would do the same thing for me. And so that's genuine concern that you're so... Um, burdened for them um, and their care and that they're they're fine they're they know the Lord and I mean you could think of the host of things that you pray for for your children that's genuine concern and Timothy was concerned for the Philippians and he was sympathetic he was concerned for their spiritual welfare and that was his biggest concern was that they learned of Christ and that they were the imitators of Christ much like our own pastors here at Twin City. I mean, I think of the countless messages that I've heard directing us to live our lives godly and, and in a Christ-like manner. And I'm thankful for those. So in verse 21, for they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul's third qualification was single-mindedness. Uh, excuse me, not Paul, Timothy. Timothy's third qualification was single-mindedness. Timothy put aside his own interests, unlike the people of Philippi. He truly loved Christ and wanted to serve him. He was all in for Christ. At a time when, much like today, false teachers abound with the health and wealth teachings we have all heard. Their ministries are self-serving with their promises of, if you give, you will get. And I'm sure we've all heard those. And we've probably all sat under that kind of teaching. But thank the Lord he changed us, right? Paul must have been truly grieved by those who did not put Christ first in their own lives, but were instead focused on themselves, self-centered. We have to be careful not to be caught in that same trap as it so easily happens. And I've heard time and time again through this COVID pandemic, um, pandemic, however you want to refer to it. Um, you know, people have gotten used to, I myself have gotten lazy with going out shopping and having everything delivered. And, and you know, we have to be careful not to let that slide over into our church life. Uh, well, it's raining and cold today. 
I think I'll stay home and live stream because it's so cold. God will be okay with that. So next Sunday, we have something going on. And, oh, well, we got to cook lunch. I'm a big cooker, so I had to use that. Um, and I cook lunch every Sunday. Well, if I stay home today, I can have lunch ready, and it'll be hot on the table, and live stream's okay. It's a good way to do church. And before you know it, you've fallen into that trap. You know, that's, that's not living for Christ because you have a self-focus in that. And the one that I've heard over and over again is the ball game, that ball game on TV. I'm not a sports fan, so... <laughs> um, but, you know, that's really not a reason to miss church got to take care of the dog. It's not a reason to miss church. It really shows you how easy it is to put your focus on yourself instead of on Christ. And we do it all the time. I'm, I am the worst, so I'm speaking to the choir here. So before you know it, a habit is formed, and you've lost fellowship with the body. Therefore, you no longer have that Christ-like, that Christ-minded likeness. So I couldn't help but think about too, and Amy will relate to this, the, the plea for people to teach here the children. You know, I know during COVID we haven't had Sunday school, but there's a, there's a huge need for our children here. And I mean, I'm as guilty probably as anybody of saying, I don't have time to do that. I didn't think I had time to do this, but the Lord will change you if you just let him. And there's so many ways that you can serve here in church. And it's selfless service. Give up that Sunday morning at home and come and put your effort into what's eternal instead of what's temporary. So verse 22, but you know Timothy's proven worth how as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. He's seasoned, and he's proven his worth, which is qualification number four. Timothy had proven his character and worth many times over through testing and trials. The church was well acquainted with Timothy as he had served them for many years. The fifth qualification, Timothy served with Paul, but he was submissive to the Lord and his will for Timothy's life. Timothy picked up and left and went wherever he was called to go with, without looking back, and it didn't matter what he had to leave behind. He was willing to be sacrificial, qualification number six. Timothy gave up his personal plans to serve the Lord in the furtherance of the gospel, serving with Paul like a child serving his father. There's no evidence that Timothy ever married had children, or experienced the joys of family life, but he was content in a life of serving the Lord, whatever that meant for him. Oh, to have that contentment. Paul wrote to the Ephesian elders, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. Timothy's life was evident of, of this also as he had learned from Paul the joy of serving the Lord. Verse 23 leads us to the seventh qualification. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Timothy was available. Timothy was ready, willing, and able to serve. He would pick up and go when Paul decided it was time. He never once said, I need to do this or that first. He picked up and went wherever Paul sent him, leaving relationships behind. He had no roots, familiarity, and never called his own shots. And that brings to mind Catherine and Kevin Bell. I mean, their ties are here and off to ministry they go. Well, what an example of picking up your roots and selfless service and being available for Christ. So how can we apply this to our lives? Let's think about Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Proverbs 27, 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. 
when we say, Lord willing, are we really serious about this? Have you ever really thought about what Lord willing means? A lot of times we say, oh, I'll do that, Lord willing. And, you know, you don't really think too much about it. But this made me really think about what it means to, to say, Lord willing. Redirect in our lives when God calls us to do something, making time for the work of the Lord. I'll be honest, it was hard for me, and I struggled with having the time to put into studying and pondering these scriptures to be able to stand before you as I am now. Even just the time to pray for God to give me the words he would have me say was a struggle, as I could think of a hundred things I needed to be doing. But the most important work we can do is not the temporariness, I think that's a word, of this life, but rather what is eternal. You know, this life is quickly passing us by. We're nothing but a vapor. And what we do for him is, is for eternity in our children's lives, in our friends' lives, in our family's lives, in our community. So laying aside the duties this world requires takes us requires of us, takes effort, but the joy of serving the Lord far surpasses any riches this world has to offer. So we can do this by working for the Lord. And the way we work for the Lord is to encourage others. In this world where technology reigns so evidently, there's no excuse why we can't call, text, or message with encouragement. If you're old-fashioned as I am, pick up the pen and write a letter. And I, try, I, do, I have started trying to do that. Carrie actually kind of convicted me of that when he said, was talking about the shut-ins one day, and I thought, how lonely that must be. You know, find, notice who's here and who's not here. If you don't see them here, write them a letter, give, send them a text, give them a call. You'd be surprised how that encourages people. Concern and care for others, genuine concern for the spiritual health of fellow believers is a demonstration of Christ-like character. It's easy if it causes no personal inconvenience, but the true test of genuine concern is neglecting one's own interests for the sakes of others. And the third way we can work for the Lord is endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. Romans 5, 4. To borrow from MacArthur's commentary, proven character means proof. It was used for testing metals to determine their purity. Here the proof is Christian character. Christians can glory in tribulations because of what those troubles produce, Christian character. And being involved in ministry, actively identifying those who can be trained requires Christ's work in us to empower us to live out the pattern he himself established in his own life, death, and resurrection. So I'll end this section again by saying, who is your Timothy? Who are you helping to encourage and mentor along the way? And John MacArthur, I read a lot of John MacArthur. The, the sing, he said, the single greatest tool in ministry is the power of an exemplary life. So in the next section, Paul introduces Epaphroditus, the diligent, behind-the-scenes worker, a suffering servant for Christ. Epaphroditus was sent to minister to Paul by the church of Philippi. They had collected money for Paul and entrusted it to Epaphroditus to deliver it to Paul. He was a common man, possibly more the type that we're able to identify with as we see his sacrificial level of service more attainable. He was not a noted leader, minister, or elder. Some references state he could have been a deacon of the church. There's no mention of Epaphroditus except here in Paul's writings. He received no public acclaim, no prominence, no high office, and had no great talents or gifts that were noted. He was not a noted preacher or teacher, but he exemplified the, sacrifice, the spirit of sacrifice for the sake of Christ. He traveled 40 days, became sick, was near death, but he never abandoned his mission to minister to Paul. He had a very common name that was taken from the Greek goddess of good luck, love, and beauty, the goddess Aphrodite. His name meant favorite of Aphrodite, which probably indicates he was from a pagan family. 
The Philippians sent him based on his genuine spiritual virtue. He was trusted, or they would not have sent the money with him. He had the heart of a servant and could minister to Paul. He must have had great courage as he knew how the Romans felt about Paul and the risk involved in going there, yet he left everything to go and serve Paul. So ponder this question as we learn more of Epaphroditus' service. Are we an Epaphroditus willing to risk everything to serve Christ? Here in the remaining verses of chapter 2, Paul writes the virtues of Epaphroditus. Verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. So Epaphroditus... His first virtue noted here is my brother. Paul considered him a brother in Christ. Paul was viewing in a personal way. They shared a common love of Christ. Paul loved Epaphroditus and had an abiding friendship and camaraderie as they served the Lord together. He was a fellow worker. He too served in the church at Philippi. Paul considered him a fellow worker in Christ. He came alongside Paul to serve in the ministry. They had an affectionate partnership deeper than just an official relationship. Paul mentions in his writings two times of godly women among his fellow workers. So don't think this doesn't apply to us as women. It does, because the first one that he referenced was Priscilla in Romans 16. She and her husband worked with Paul and risked their lives in his ministry. The second were Euodia and Sintiq, two godly but quarreling members of the Church of Philippi whom Paul urged to work in unity in Philippians 4.2. Paul calls all all believers God's fellow workers in 1 Corinthians 3.9. He was also a fellow soldier. He was a leader in spiritual warfare against the enemies who fought against the gospel. He put on the whole armor of God, as we read in Galatians, and ministered to the believers in Rome despite the danger he might face. And again, he never abandoned his mission of protecting Paul and ministering to Paul. And then Paul says he was their their messenger, referencing the church of Philippi. They sent him there. Epaphroditus was chosen by the church of Philippi to go and serve Paul. He was an apostle an apostle with a little a. Not in the same sense that the apostles were of Christ. Apostle with a capital A is chosen by Christ, and apostle with a little a is chosen by the church. So Epaphroditus was chosen by the church to represent them, to take them and deliver the money to Paul there in Rome. And Epaphroditus was also to minister to Paul's needs. He was at great personal expense He put his life on the line. He was a self-giving, tireless, sacrificial, and humble servant of the highest caliber whom Paul greatly loved. In verse 26, Paul states, For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Epaphroditus was not homesick. He did long for his fellow believers in Philippi, but he was not homesick. His distress was not related to his sickness nor himself because he never put himself first, but rather the distress the Philippians suffered when they learned of his sickness. His distress was so great he could have become distracted and less useful to Paul, who must have felt that he would, could better serve back in Philippi. Paul had compassion for Epaphroditus, as he could have just told him to snap out of it, but he didn't. He also had compassion for the Philippians by sending Epaphroditus back to them, which comforted all parties involved. Epaphroditus' distress was relieved by seeing the Philippians' distress relieved. And at seeing the Philippians' distress relieved, Paul then in turn was relieved by seeing that. So they were, they were relieved to see him alive and well, and Paul was relieved because he could see their joy and how they rejoiced when they were able to see Epaphroditus. Verse 27, indeed he was ill and near to death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, 
but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Mercy refers to God's action on behalf of his people that stems from his compassion for them in their miserable state. It's most always connected to deliverance and healing. God spared the life of Epaphroditus through his mercy. Through, his, through this, he also had mercy on Paul, as he loved Epaphroditus so much that his death would have caused Paul sorrow upon sorrow, which is defined in most commentaries as wave after wave of grief and tremendous grief. Verse 28, I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. The Philippians would rejoice at seeing Epaphroditus again, that he was alive and well. This, in turn, would allow Paul to have great joy seeing them rejoice. Once again, Paul exhibits an act of selfless sacrifice for the people that he loved. Philippians 2.3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Paul was urging the Philippians to receive Epaphroditus as if receiving the Lord and to hold him as a highly prized and honored man because he had represented them well. He didn't fail in his mission. He completed his mission in taking care of Paul. But Paul felt it best to send him back to them and felt he could better serve by doing that. And in verse 30, he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Epaphroditus came close to death in his service for Christ. He became sick, feeble, and weak. His near-death experience should not be surprising to us as he was following in the footsteps of Paul and Jesus Christ. He lived as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12.10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Epaphroditus came close to death. Oh, sorry. The... the Philippians could not come to Paul to serve him, so when Paul references completing what was lacking in your service to me, he means that very thing, that the Philippians were all not able to come. They couldn't all just pack up and come, so they chose a representative to go. And Epaphroditus was sent in their stead. He not only delivered the money the Philippians had collected, but possibly served Paul by getting provisions, maintaining contact with other believers in Rome, and simply by fellowship and encouragement to Paul. These are the things the Philippians could not do for Paul at this time. Epaphroditus is sometimes referred to as the loving gambler, as he, with total disregard for his own welfare, continually put his life on the line for the work of Christ. And I did use several commentaries in looking all this up, and they all referenced this um, little story that I wanted to read to you that came directly from William Barclay's writings that was referenced in, in most all commentaries concerning the gambler. So soon after New Testament times, a group of Christians banded together in an association they called Parabolani, which means the gamblers. Taking Epaphroditus as their model, they visited prisoners and ministered to the sick, especially those with dangerous, communicable diseases whom no one else would help. They boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they went. When the city of Carthage on the Mediterranean coast of North Africa suffered a severe plague in AD 252, the pagan inhabitants were so frightened of contagion that they refused to touch the dead bodies, even to bury them. Cyprian, bishop of the church there, led the Christians in the arduous and dangerous task of ministering to the sick and dying and of burying the thousands of corpses. The spiritual influence of that silent but powerful testimony on their unbelieving and formerly hostile neighbors, doubtless, was immeasurable. So I, I really felt like that was very relevant to today. I mean, it makes me think of this COVID pandemic and the spread throughout the world and what a, what a 
panic there is, you know, of staying away from everybody, and we're losing contact with each other. So I, I really, that really kind of hit home when I, I read that. And again, John MacArthur's statement came to mind, the single greatest tool in ministry is the power of an exemplary life. And I wonder how those people felt when those Christians came in with total disregard for them, their own lives to help those sick people. I think of our frontline workers now, our nurses and doctors, and we got a lot of them in this church. And they're out there giving of themselves to, to work long, long hours with the sick. So in summary, Paul, Timothy, and Epaphroditus were all three very different individuals. Paul, a boldless, fearless leader. Timothy, his quiet, devoted self, his quiet, devoted assistant. Epaphroditus, a diligent, behind-the-scenes worker. Yet all three manifested the most important characteristic of a godly life and leader, a life worth imitating. A servant of God is identified by their seeking the interests of others more than their own. We can recognize genuine servants of the Lord by observing their proven worth in the context of ministry and life and also risking one's life for the work of Christ. And, and the way that we can observe them in the context of life and ministry is their genuine concern for others. Are, are, we, are we out here putting others first and... and staying in contact with them, even though we're in a masked society now and everybody's afraid of everybody. You can't lose the genuine concern because that's how we all fellowship, and we're called to fellowship with the body. And seeking the interests of Christ rather than self, working for the spread of the gospel. And the risking of your life is, is sacrificially serving others. You're not actually in harm's way, like the missionaries are out in the mission fields, but there's plenty of ways you can risk your life here. I mean, there's lots of people who, in their jobs, are, are shut down. You know, you can't talk about that at work. And, and, it, and it's a truth, a very real thing here. So... Proverbs 31, I always go back to Proverbs 31 for some reason, um, seems to lead us as women. And I have these marked, but I think my bookmarks are on the table. Hmm. Proverbs 31, 30, and 31. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. And I'm thinking about how, how we as women can be very active here in the church and ministering to other women, the, the elderly women, to the younger women, and, and think of the, the women who have children and moms out here who, can, who don't get a break and they don't have anybody to encourage them. So I challenge you to find somebody that you can do that for whether you're mentoring or whether you're learning. I think any, any um, mature woman here in the church, if you approached them and said, I'd like you to be my mentor, I don't think there'd be a one that would turn you down. I can't, can't think of any that, that would. All right, and, and Titus 1.15, I just wanted to read that in reference to false teachers. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. So be careful not to fall into that. Be careful not to stray away from church. Be careful not to form those habits that take you away from the body of Christ, lest all things are not pure and you fall aside to the way. So we'll revisit those questions asked earlier. Who is your Paul? Have you sought out a mature Christian mentor? What a luxury we have to be blessed with so many ladies mature in their faith who would love to encourage you who are younger and still growing in your love for the Lord. In a world filled with technology, even when COVID abounds, there's plenty of ways to meet, pray, and study with a mentor who would love to share their love for Christ with you. 
And the second question, who is your Timothy? For those of us in our mature years, and it's kind of hard to put yourself there, but I am, uh, who are we seeking to encourage and mentor? The Lord has brought many young families to Twin City, and we're blessed to have them serve alongside us. There are many young moms who would love to have a mentor. And even discipling our children. That's one of the greatest things that we can do is disciple our children. And I don't know how many of you have read the renowned author's book, Keeping Your Balance, but she talks about that. She says the priority of our lives um, and how important it is. And I won't spoil the book for you if you haven't read it, but... It's, it's truly an important part of discipleship in, in leading your children to Christ and just living that life, the exemplary life in front of them that imitates Christ that they can see. Um, even in my own children, now in their adult years, every now and then they'll slip a little card to me and say, thank you for living that godly life in front of me. Thank you for being that godly example. And that really encourages me that the Lord is working on them to, to strengthen and grow them in him and that they're noticing not just me but others who, who imitate the life of Christ. So you're being watched whether you know it or not. My children at least are watching you. So um, finally, are we like Epaphroditus, all in for Christ, jumping at opportunities to serve, our love for Christ ought to be so evident that anyone watching us could know there's something different about us. And I'm certainly guilty of not serving when I have the opportunity. I've turned down a lot of times that I should have said yes. And I've said yes a lot of times I should have said no because there's many ways to serve, but you never want to get so involved in church or anything for that matter, that you forget about discipling others and you forget about especially discipling your children. And that, I keep going back to that. That's a huge thing. So there's, there's lots of ways to serve here at church and in our everyday lives in a world that's full of hopelessness and fear. We can be as Paul desired for the Philippians, imitators of Christ, that we would reflect the hope and joy that comes from serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, there was another quote from the commentary that I just couldn't, couldn't keep from reading, and I know I'm probably going to go over here, but I'm going to read it anyway. Left to ourselves, we remain self-centered, but the Spirit of God is at work in us to transform us into the image of Christ, the suffering servant. As a result, we serve not merely when it's convenient or costs us little, but when it costs us dearly. When we may not be called to risk our physical safety to serve others in the name of Christ, but Jesus says to all his followers, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Mark 8, 34 through 35. After all, even the Son of Man came not to serve, be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45. And why should we, as his followers, adopt any other mindset than that of Christ? So I'll close with just a couple more scriptures, and then I'm done, I promise. So Timothy... 2, 11 through 14, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing, appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for his good works. And I trust that we will be zealous for his good works. So if you'll, we'll close in prayer. Father, I thank you for this letter written so long ago, but still so valid in our lives today. Help us, Lord, to be imitators of Christ, that you would reveal your word to us, grow us in our love and devotion to you, 
Father, I ask that our hearts will be ignited to have a burning desire to serve you according to your will for our lives. I pray for each lady listening tonight. I pray they would be drawn closer to you and that, that they would seek to serve you with a selfless love. Putting aside the things of this world that are temporary and investing in the things that are eternal. Lord, I want to lift up a Melinda Tillis to you tonight on the loss of her mother. I pray that you would comfort her, Lord, give her encouragement in her grief. But I pray also that you would help her to be bold for you, even, even in her distress, Lord, that, she, that you would be glorified. As your love is so evident in the life of Melinda, I pray also for our upcoming ladies' conference that you'd be with our guest speaker, Sheila, as she's recovering from her sickness. Lord, heal her, strengthen her, and as she prepares to bring your word to the ladies at the conference. Help us as we plan in the conference and all the preparations necessary that our work would be glorifying to you, Lord, and that you would bring many people to the conference, Lord, many, many helpers, many workers, to help glorify you, Lord. I pray you would have us have those that attend to grow spiritually and have a desire to serve you. I thank you for the opportunity to serve you, Lord, here at Twin City and for the body you've brought here to serve. Lord, I pray we would serve in unity, with humility, and with the mindset of Christ, and that we would put aside our own comfort and take on the form of a servant willing to suffer for Christ. Help us in our journey this week and keep us according to your perfect will. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Donna. That was excellent. That was a great challenge to all of us, just to really intentionally stay involved in each other's lives and there's been a lot of things working against that this past year it's been harder and you really have to um, again intentionally do that so that's a great challenge thank you um, I did forget to um, check and see if there was anybody new tonight nobody here for the first time okay uh, very good. And Donna did uh, mention our ladies conference, and I do want you to definitely start thinking towards that. It's going to be uh, Friday night and Saturday, April the 9th and the 10th. And if you've ever been to one of our ladies conferences before, you know they are a wonderful time. And it's just a great time of teaching and fellowship, and it really is a special time for us to come together. So please uh, make plans to be there, and uh, you'll be seeing things in the bulletin soon, and you'll be hearing things on the TC Connection and on our Facebook page. So again, I think we're going to start uh, signing up around, did we decide the 1st of March? or uh, That's right, I'm sorry. I'm a month behind, 1st of February, okay? And then we'll give you a couple of months to sign up. So please don't miss that, all right? Um, all right, let's go to our groups. Um, Cheryl's in here, Lorraine's in the lobby. Uh,